just a minute, please. My apologies for that. Hello, welcome to White Daily Gardening and Worm Farm Q&A Live. So we're going to be discussing more about worms as usual. And of course, you may know from time to time, I repeat some of my information that I've shared on previous lives. And the reason for doing so is because the live is dedicated to both beginners and worm farmers in various stages of the worm farming. So for the sake of those who are new to my channel or they're new to worm farming, then from time to time, I may repeat some of the information so that nobody gets left behind. Right. Silence this thing. Okay. So, do worms actually eat food scraps? What do you think? Worms do not eat our food scraps. They do, however, feed on the bacteria that breaks down the food scraps. So that is what they feed on and not the food scraps directly. Which is why they don't necessarily need to have teeth, which is why they don't have teeth. Now, how long do worms live? That depends on a number of factors, but on average, worms can live 10 years in captivity, or they can live around three years in the wild. They can live for a very, very long time, even more than 10 years. But the reason their life cycle tend to be an average of three years in the wild is because they are prone, prone to a lot of predators. So for that reason, a lot of them don't get to live very long. But I've heard of instances where the Canadian night crawlers can live up to 25 years. So they can live long depending on the circumstance. Oh, hi, Han White. Now, how often should you feed your worm is a question that a lot of beginners ask. Now, how often you feed your worms is one of those questions that depend on the factor, a few factors as well, such as is your worm bin indoors or outdoors? What type of worm bins do you have? What do you feed your worms? Now, if your worm bin is outdoors all year round, then you can add food scraps to your bin as much as you like. So every time you have food scraps, you can add it to your worm bin. And if you have a large worm bin, then you can add any amount of food scraps to it if the bin is outdoors all year round. Now, this is because the bin, when it is outdoors, it is exposed to more airflow, which is important. And you don't have to worry about fruit flies in your house or, and also because the airflow will help to prevent your bin from getting moldy. So if your bin is outdoors, then you can put any amount of food scraps in there. If the bin has a lot of airflow, which so it is recommended that you turn your bin so that you can increase the airflow, depending on the type of bin you have, some bins may allow more airflow than others. For example, if you're using a windrow system, then the entire surface of your worm bin is open so the um, air can get in. 
And if you have bins that are made from pallets, then it has a lot of space where air can go in and out. So it depends how much you feed your worms or how often you feed your worms depend on the circumstance. So if your bin is large and you have it full of food scraps and bedding, then it'll create more space for your worms. And the more space the worms have and the more food the worms have, the faster they're going to be reproducing, the faster they're going to be eating. So in that case, you can feed a lot or feed your worm bin quite often. Now, if you are feeding food scraps indoors, you have to be concerned about the airflow in your worm bin. You have to be concerned about how fast your worms feed to ensure that your bin do not become moldy does not become anaerobic or acidic. Now your bin can, even if you feed, if you feed your bin too much and it is indoors, even outdoors sometimes, your bin can become anaerobic if it's not getting enough here and it can become acidic. Now that once it becomes anaerobic, it will become acidic and your bin will start to smell. So because you don't want your bin to smell if it is indoors, then you do not want to feed it too much. So you monitor how much, how fast your worms are feeding and then you feed them accordingly. Hi Rodney. Don't think have enough airflow I opened and it had a tons of flies. I think I will keep open during spring and summer. Yes, and it would be nice if you were able to open your bin, but at the same time have some form of screen over the bin so that it can help to keep the flies from going in. Because even if your bin is open, once your bin is open and it does not have anything, any form of screen that can prevent flies from going in, they're going to be going in there because they can smell food scraps from miles away. So if you can get a mesh and keep it covered, then that would increase your airflow and at the same time protect you from having flies entering your bin. Yes, so worms, they say, can eat half, up to half, or their body weight in a day. So when you use such information to know how to feed your worms, then you can avoid your bin becoming moldy when it is indoors because that is the biggest concern if your bin is indoors you don't want the mold and you don't want the flies and stuff like that we need to monitor better is quarter inch mesh too big yes quarter inch mesh is too big for example if flies have soft bodies so they can get into small spaces and you may have problem mostly with fruit flies rather than the large flies in your worm bin and so for that reason you want something with really really small holes in it so even a t-shirt or an old sheet can work because the air will get through but the flies won't get in or you can use something like a window screen the mesh that you use on your windows that will work well as too so yes you can get that but any type of fabric that does not have large holes in it will work. Of course, with your outdoor bin, you still have to worry about insects or pests getting in there. But at least you don't have to deal with those pests being inside your home. And sometimes, depending on the type of bin that you have outdoors, you can control to some extent the amount or the type of pest that gets into your worm bin. So these factors will affect how much you can feed your worms. Yes, an old t-shirt works well. Now, why is worm farming so important? Well, for one, they recycle your, your kitchen waste. They recycle the material that you have from harvesting, what remains after you've harvested your garden. They help you to recycle your papers and your cardboard and stuff like that, your leaves around the home. 
So, and then by doing so, you're keeping all of these products out of the landfill. So that is one reason why it is so important. It is also important because when you worm farm, the nutrients that the worm casting produce will be very beneficial for your plants. It also helps to control pests on your plants and it helps to build healthy soil. It is important also because it produces a lot of beneficial microbes that are good for both your soil and for your plants. It reduces, sorry, it releases the nutrients slowly, thus providing your plants with nutrients for much longer. Hi, her healthy home. Yes, yeah, so it provides your plants with nutrients for longer because it slowly releases its nutrients. So unlike other form of organic matter, unless it is specifically designed that way for those commercial types, but like things like compost and stuff, they don't slowly release their nutrients. The casting, however, slowly releases its nutrients because of the oil that is on the alimentary canal of your worms that coats the castings. So it helps your plants to have nutrients on a continuous basis because it is said that it takes up to two months for this oil that coats your castings to break down. So that is why it slowly releases its nutrients. Another reason why worm casting is so important is that unlike most things that we use on our plants, worm castings will not burn your plants. So here are some questions of concern regarding castings because of the fact that it slowly releases its nutrients. Do you need to worry about how slow your plants, sorry, your casting release nutrients in terms of will your plants have enough nutrients? Well, the fact is the plants will get enough nutrients even though the casting is slowly releases the use is slowly releasing the nutrients. Now this is because worm casting has far more nutrients than compost and other types of organic supplements. So the plants will get enough nutrients from it. Now what if the plants need a quick boost of nutrients but then the casting only releases its nutrients slowly? In this case, worm tea works very well. So the worm casting is water soluble. So when you use it to create the worm tea, it will cause that coating to break down faster. And then by doing so, the nutrients will be released into the liquid and then you just use that to water your plants. So if you need, if your plants need a quick boost, then you can still use your worm casting. It's just that now you're going to make it into a worm tea so that the nutrients is more readily available. Let's see. Her Healthy Home says, hit the like button, everyone. Thank you, Her Healthy Home. Okay, so how does microbe in the soil compare to microbes in worm castings? Microbes that are found in worm castings can be as much as 10 to 20 times what is found in your soil. So worm casting has up to 20 times more microbes than what's in the soil. Hi, Mark Bajan. Sorry, you're late. Good afternoon, all. Yes, um, no worries. Um, you come on based on the time that you are available. <laughs> We're all very busy, so yeah, you're not considered being late. Okay, so how much moisture does castings hold? 
castings can hold up to two or three times its weight. So if you have a pound of castings, it can hold two to three pounds of moisture. That is why, oh, hi, Melanie. That is why worm casting is so good for retaining moisture in your soil because it can hold twice to three times the amount or the weight of the castings. And that is one more reason why worm casting is so important or worm farming is so important because it helps you to save on the amount of water that you use to water your plants. It's hard. It also helps you to save money if you're watering from the top. And it also ensures that your plants have moisture for longer. Hi, Peggy. Greetings from Wind Windermere, Florida, Zone 9B. Okay, welcome to the live, Peggy. And hi, Leafy Wiggy. Let's see, I finished my work for the day. It was installing agriculture mounds in the garden. Interesting concept, I have never heard of it before. Okay. Yes. So, where was I? Okay, we were looking at worm casting and how much moisture it can hold. So two to three times its weight. Now, what temperatures do worms prefer? This depends on the type of worms that you have. So, if you have red wigglers, then they prefer temperatures between 50 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 10 to 25, excuse me, 10 to 25 degrees Celsius. Blue worms prefer temperatures of 45 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 7 to 32 degrees Fahrenheit. European night crawlers prefer 45 to 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 7 to 21 degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry, Celsius, 7 to 21 degrees Celsius. African night crawlers prefer 65 to 60 to 95 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 15 to 35 degrees Celsius. And your Canadian night crawlers prefer 40 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 4.4 to 26 degrees Celsius. So if you are living in the warmer, like the really hot regions, then African night crawlers and the blue worms will do well. So if you're thinking of starting a worm bin, you might wonder what type of worms to get. Now, there are many things to consider when you are thinking of starting a worm bin in terms of the type of worms that you get. But the most important one is temperature, the conduct, um, climatic conditions around you. So if you're in the hotter environment, then you want to consider getting the African night crawlers and the blue worms because these can stand a good amount of heat. If you're in a moderate environment, then you might consider your European night crawlers and your red wigglers. Now, red wigglers is very adaptive. And so even though they prefer temperatures between 50 and 77, they do well in cooler weather and warmer weather. And if you're in a cold environment, oh, hi, Siraj. Yeah, so if you're in a colder environment, then you might want to consider raising your Canadian night crawlers. Now, some worms may require more care than others. For example, the Canadian night crawlers, they're very 
sensitive to eat they're very sensi sensitive to change. All worms are sensitive to change, but the Canadian night crawlers, they definitely cannot handle heat. So if you're contemplating raising Canadian night crawlers, then it is important that you are able to keep them cool during the summer, because if you can't, they are going to die. So out of the, all the worms that I've listed so far, the Canadian night crawlers are the most finicky, yeah, so considering your climatic condition is the first thing you want to take into mind when you're thinking of raising worms. However, if you're raising them inside your home and not outdoors, then it doesn't really matter much because it's fairly consistent temperatures indoors. Um, in the summer, it might be a bit hotter indoors, depending on whether or not you're using AC or the airflow in your home but the temperature is fairly consistent inside the home but if you're raising them in an area where it's not heated during the winter then you have to consider your climatic condition and what worm is best for you to use melanie says watched the anything goes worm casting starting video and it looks so simple i think i'm going to start one <laughs> okay. See what Bajan says. That's a nice saying, Leafy. Okay. Peggy says, I have red wigglers in my can of worms since 2009, and I've never had any, never had, or never had to had any. Okay. I have it in my house, so the house temperature stays at 78 degrees Fahrenheit. Yes. They are pretty they are pretty resilient, these um red wigglers. Because in February when we had severe cold weathers, minus 60 for a few days it was in the minus 60, and for about two weeks it was in the minus 50s. And all of my i think about 12 of my worm bins froze all the bins that were close to the ground froze and some of the worms crawled out unfortunately if you crawl out of the bin then there's no hope of them surviving but for those that remained in the bin they froze the bin froze but then because i was able to take action quickly there those that remain in the bin survived so the red wigglers even though it is said that they prefer 50 to 55 to 75 degrees Fahrenheit, they are pretty resilient. They can stand some amount of heat. They can stand some amount of cold as long as they're not exposed to these conditions for extended period of time. And I guess it's the same goes for all the worms. They can withstand a little bit cooler or warmer weather as long as it's not for any extended period of time. Peggy says, I harvested castings almost monthly since 2009 in Florida. Nice. That's very nice. So Peggy, do you ever have any issue where you have more worms than you can handle or your worm bin is overcrowding? Okay, so why do worms try to escape the worm bin? There are several reasons why worms will try to escape worm bin. Okay, you've never had that issue. That's good. Yes, it's so good. Um, worms are able to regulate their rate of reproduction and they will reproduce more if they have more space and more food. And if they don't have a lot of space and more and a lot of food, then they tend to slow down. So yes, you're correct. They regulate themselves. Yes. Now, why do worms try to escape your bins? If the condition in your bin is too wet, they're going to try to escape. If it is acidic, 
if it is overcrowded, if it is too hot or too cold, if the bin is new, or if you're overfeeding them. Uh, so I'm going to elaborate on these reasons a little bit more. So if your worm bin is too wet, it is an indication. Um, it is usually because one, you're either adding too much moisture or sometimes the food scraps that you're adding might be one with a very high moisture content. For example, things like lettuces has really high water content. So if the food scraps that you're adding has high water content, then don't water your bin because the food scraps is going to produce enough moisture for the bin. If it is too wet, you can always add shredded paper to the bin and that will help to dry it out or you can increase the airflow in that bin also to help dry it out. If your bin is too acidic, it is either because you are adding too much acidic food to the bin or it can be because you are not aerating the bin enough. The bin doesn't have enough air supply. So the bin becomes anaerobic, which leads to the bin being acidic. So if that is the case, then you may need to add some crushed eggshell or some diatomaceous earth or some oyster shell crushed to the bin to help to neutralize the acid. Or you can add some garden lime to the bin to help to neutralize the acid in it. Sorry, I need to run. Great info for everyone interested. I hope to watch more of your videos. Okay, thank you, Peggy. And have a safe and a lovely day. Yes. Now, if your bin is overcrowded, meaning that there's too much worms in the bin, then you can always create a new worm bin and divide the content of the bin. The thing, the good thing though, is that if you do not want to have more bins than you have, like Peggy says, the worms will regulate their numbers. And so some worms will leave the bin, the older worms will leave the bin so that the younger ones will have space. And by doing so, they are going to regulate the amount of them in the bin. In addition to that, they are going to control how often they reproduce. Now, if your bin is too hot or too cold, if it, if it is in an environment where you can change the temperature of the environment, then good to do so. If the bin is too cold, you can always add a blanket on top of the bin to warm it up. Or you can, if it is sunny and warm outdoors, if your bin is not outdoors, you can put it outdoors. If your bin is too hot, then you might need to increase the airflow in the bin whether you're going to remove the cover of the bin or you're going to put the bin in some shaded area or stuff like that. But some people suggest using ice water or cold water to cool down your bin. That is not a good idea because worms respond to the slightest changes in temperature. They don't like it and it's going to slow them down very much you don't want that to happen. So what you're going to do is use water. If you're going to be wetting your bin, use water that is close in temperature to the temperature of the bin. But do not have drastically different temperatures to your worm bin at any point in time. Let's see. Leafy says, I always have leaf. In my oh sorry I always leave my bin lid open for an hour or two every day no smell at all yet yes your bin should not have a um, smell um, a foul smell that is your bin supposed to have an earthy smell if it has any smell other than an earthy smell then you know something is wrong with the bin so yes it's a good idea to give to leave your bin open for a while, especially if you know it is safe where flies and stuff like that won't get in and that you can control by burying your food scraps, although they still are able to smell the food scraps to some extent, but it will reduce the amount of them that is attracted to it. 
But yes, it's nice to leave your bin open so they can get air. Now, for new bins, the worms tend to try to escape simply because it is a new environment that they are not accustomed to. So it's not that there is something wrong with the bin. It's just that they are not accustomed to the environment. And it usually takes about two to three weeks up to for them to get used to the new environment. So you just have to give them time and keep monitoring them. Sometimes, of course, if you are new to worm farming and you put your worms in there, they might be leaving the bin, not necessarily because it is a new environment, but if you're new to worm farming and you don't fully understand what kind of environment worms prefer, then you might have your bin being too wet or you might have your bin being too acidic or food acidic food in your bin and that might cause them to leave. But in most cases with a new bin, it is usually because they're in a new environment, so they take time to settle down. Overfeeding can be another cause for worms leaving. As I said in the earlier part of the live that there are times when you can overfeed your bin and there are times when there is no concern about overfeeding your bin. So in an outdoor settings where you have the proper airflow and stuff like that, you can add any amount of food to your worm bin and the worms will be okay. Uh, but if you are keeping your worm bin indoors and you only have so much worms to eat so much food in a day or in a week, you don't want to have too much food scraps in the bin because then it's going to attract all kind of pests in your home that you do not want. Yes, yeah, so you need to monitor your worms so that you know how much to feed them when you're keeping them indoors. There are some who stick to the principle that um, you should just give them just enough that they can eat. But in my personal experience, hi Princess Lillian, in my personal experience with outdoor bin, and my outdoor bins are wooden bins. Some of them are compost bins made of pallets that my worms that I put worms in, and then I have those that are specifically designed worm bins made of wood. I just whatever amount of worms or food scraps I have, it goes in the bin. In my compost bin, I just put the worms in there, and they completely go through the compost bin in two and a half to three months so the amount of food does not really matter if it is an outdoor bin i don't really know because i've never really experienced having a one of those regular size worm bin that people use so whether it is the can of worms or the what do they call it those bags that they use for vermicomposting or if you're using one of those little totes i have no experience with using those outdoors or indoors for those kind of worms or those types of worm bins so i will not say that you can or cannot overfeed with using those because i've never used those bins yes but you have to be concerned about the pests if you're having your worms indoors and how much space you have. So it's up to you to know, but for indoor purposes, it's recommended that you feed them according to how much they can eat within a certain period of time. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about creatures in your worm bin. There are all sorts of creatures in your worm bin. The list is endless. Most of them are okay in your worm bin. There are some of them that are reasons for concern. So we're gonna just talk a little bit about these. So you can have things like fruit flies, earwigs, white mites, red mites, springtails, green beetles, ants, potworms, 
slugs and snails, millipede, centipede, roly poly, and all these things in your worm bin. Now, soldier flies are beneficial in your worm bin. They are decomposers. White mites, they help to keep your bin tidy. They are not harmful to neither you nor your worms. But if you have too much white mites in your bin, then they will compete for the food and your worm will shy away if the population is too much. So, hi, pit stop. <laughs> Okay, so thank you for stopping by. <laughs> yes, so if you have too much of the white mites in your bin, then the worms will shy away. Red mites, however, they are harmful in your worm bin. They are parasites to your worm. So if you have red mites, then you might want to do all that you can to get rid of them. Springtail. They feed on mold and decaying matter in your worm bin. A small of them is small amount of them is not harmful, but large amount will attack any worms that are weak, the weaker worms in your worm bin. But they also help to clean up worms that die in your worm bin. If you have too much of them in your worm bin, however, they may prevent your worms from coming up to the surface to feed. They carry things like spores and bacteria that breaks down vegetables. Pot worms are harmless. They help to break down the stuff that are in your worm bin. But then if you see a large population of pot worms, it is an indication that your bin is either too moist or that your bin is acidic. And the pot worms, although they're good decomposers, or because they're good decomposers, they will compete with your worms for the food. Roly polies, they are not harmful. Their presence indicate moisture or too much moisture. And they are very good composers or decomposers. Hi, Robert James. Pot worms are naturally in every soil. Wherever you have soil, pot worms will be there. But because they are so small, if they are in small quantities, you might not notice their presence because they can be anything from invisible, depending on their size, to the naked eyes, to up to three quarters of an inch in length. And they are usually as thin as thread. Sometimes you can see that it is a bigger worm than they actually are because they like to group together, but they are usually pretty skinny thread-like worms that can go up to three quarters of an inch long. So they are always present. All of these creatures that are mentioned here, a lot of them can be found in your worm bin, but because they are, in, they are so tiny and they are in small quantities, so a lot of times you will not notice them, but they are there. It doesn't mean every one of them is there, but in most cases, a lot of them are there. You're welcome, Robert. Earwigs, they love darkness. They are not harmful to your worms, and they are very good decomposers. Millipedes, have two legs per body segment, so that is how you identify them, and they are actually beneficial decomposers in your worm bin. Soldier flies are nocturnal, and they will lay their larvae in your bin. All is well as long as there is no meat in your bin. These will actually decompose, they will actually decompose the material in your bin, they will also help to control housefly population in your bin. They are not harmful and they don't spread disease. Oh, 
Okay, so earwigs, springtail, millipedes, soldier flies, these are considered beneficial insects in your worm bin or in your garden. Ants, roly poly, potworms, and fruit flies are considered benign in your worm bin. Ants are not harmful, neither are they beneficial in your worm bin. But if you see a lot of ants in your bin, it's an indication that your worm bin is too dry. The biggest problem with ants in your worm bin is that they will compete for the food. And the tendency of ants is once they find food, they are going to take as much as they can carry and they can lift up to 50 times their body weight. So they're going to take food back to their colony. And when they go back to the economy, they're going to bring other workers with them and they're just going to keep coming and going and transporting food. So they're going to be competing with your worms for the food. And so you might want to get rid of them. And to do this, cornmeal works very well or diatomaceous earth to help to get rid of the ants. Or you can wet the bin down, but sometimes you have to be careful because you can make your bin too wet. So diatomaceous earth or cornmeal is a better option. Fruit flies are not harmful, but they increase their population very rapidly and they can take over your home if you have your worm bins indoors. So if you can get rid of them or prevent them from getting in your bin in the first place, then that is recommended. Centipedes, however, they use their venom to incapacitate its prey, including the worms that are in your bin. They bite humans, but they're not dangerous to humans, but they'll bite you. So if you have centipedes in your bin, then you want to get rid of them. So centipedes, red mites, also known as earthworm mites, which are parasites to worms. Snails and slugs, these are considered bad for your worm bin. The snails and slugs do not affect your worms and they do not affect your castings. They are just, they're simply feeding on the food scraps, but then they're going to lay their eggs in your castings. And then when you use those castings in your garden, those eggs are going to hatch and the slugs are going to eat down your plants. So for those reasons, you want to get rid of them. Make sure you don't have them in your worm bin. Now, how do you control or get rid of these creatures? One, by having a lot of bedding to cover your food scraps. So when you create a bin, you usually have bedding at the bottom of your worm bin. Then you feed on top of that food scraps you want to cover your food scraps with more bedding because that is going to help to control the smell that is going to attract some of these creatures like the fruit flies. It is going to help to prevent smell from attracting rodents like rats and mites. So having bedding to cover your food scraps, managing the pH level in your bin because things like mites springtails and potworms, they love acidic conditions. So you can add buffers or things that are going to neutralize your bin in order to manage the pH. So dolomite lime, crushed eggshell, crushed oyster shell, diatomaceous earth, all of these will help to control the moistures in your bin. Let's see, Robert James says, will neem cake keep the fruit flies down? I'm not sure what effect the neem cake has on the fruit flies, but it does keep some of the pests in your garden down. I think it does work on fruit flies as well. But I know it works for, the, for things like the mites. So if it works for the mites, then it might work for the fruit flies, but I'm not certain of that. And it is funny that you're asking about the neem cake because that was <laughs> the next thing that I was about to mention. 
Yes, so it is good for eradicating the mites, but I don't really know about for the fruit flies. Feeding your bin is another method that you can use to control the presence of these pests in your worm bin. So for those that like acidic conditions, you're going to make sure that you avoid feeding acidic food to your worm bin. Keeping your bin aerated is another way that you can reduce the bin, um, prevent the risk of your bin becoming anaerobic and leading to your bin becoming acidic. When you overfeed and your worms can't keep up with the amount of food that you're giving, that can make your bin anaerobic and acidic as well. So feeding the worms a reasonable amount that they can manage within a certain period of time is a good way to control some of these pests. And the more food scraps you have in your worm bin, the, likely, the more likely it is that these pests that are present in your garden, in your worm bin, is going to increase their population. So these are some of the options that you can use to control them. Don't overwater your bin because some of these pests like moist conditions. So make sure you regulate the amount of moisture that you're, use, that you're using in your worm bin. And then as I mentioned before, using some form of screen covering also will help to reduce the population of these things in a bin. Now, if your bin has too much mites and roly-poly, well, the roly-polies are not harmful to your bin, so it doesn't really matter much for them. But for the potworms and the mites that love both acidic condition and a lot of moisture, Drying out your bin a bit will help to control their population because they tend to dry to die off. But then you have to be careful to what extent you dry out your bin because the worms breathe through their skin and they cannot breathe unless they have moist conditions. And the next reason why you don't want your bin to be too moist is that even though worms require moisture to breathe, they don't want to be immersed in water unless, of course, your water is constantly being aerated. So if, you're, if they're in water and it is constantly being aerated, then they're fine. They can live in it for, for eternity. But if the water is just sitting there stagnant, then they won't be able to breathe because the water is going to restrict the airflow for them and then they won't be able to breathe. So. These are the options that you have. These are the type of pests that you can have in your worm bin. Of course, there might be a lot of other pests that you can have in your worm bin, but I'm not really familiar with any other type. If you are familiar with other type of pests that I did not mention here, or if you know of other remedies apart from the ones that I mentioned and you'd like to share it, then please feel free to do so. So this is all of the information that I have prepared for you guys today. So if there's anything that you'd like to talk about, then feel free. And if, and if not, then we are going to be saying goodbye until I see you again on Monday when we are going to be having our gardening q a live discussion and that one is at 5 p.m for those who may not be familiar with my channel so on fridays it's worm farming q a in at 12 gmt six time or mondays it is gardening q a at 5 p.m let's see the famous mouse in bin. Yes, those little buggers. <laughs> I don't like them. They they are very annoying. And some of them, I know rats will eat your worms. I don't know about the mice, but yes, there are annoying little creatures in the bin. Okay, you too, Matt Bajan. Have a wonderful day.
I found a few sprouts with my worms. I replanted them. Okay, yes. That is always going to be the case where things are sprouting in, in your worm bin. And sometimes these things, if, if it is an outdoor worm bin, like for example, my compost bin, and you just let it stay in the compost bin and grow, the size of the plant that grows in there is so big and the size of the produce that you get is just, yeah, the worm casting is powerful stuff, but you'll always have things growing in there. Let's see. Hi, May Homestead. Optimum moisture levels are tough to maintain considering that worms like moisture too, just like mites. Yes, I agree with you on that. Um, they both of them like the moist conditions, so it can be a bit tricky dealing with them. And so, one good way that you can um, control these is by removing them from your bin by soaking bread in milk, and then they will go after that. They will go on it or underneath it and eat, and you just remove the bread with them on it, and just keep repeating that process until you have reduced their population drastically. Of course, sometimes you're going to have red wigglers or whatever type of worms you raise on the bread as well. Sometimes some of them are going to be in the bread and you won't be able to see them, but it's only a few compared to the amount of mites that you will be getting rid of if you use this method. Let's see. How many worms been are you up to? Okay. I'm up to 70 worm bins at the moment, but that doesn't mean that I have a lot of worms. I like to spread my worms out thin so that they have a lot of space to run around because then they tend to reproduce more. Yeah, so having 70 doesn't necessarily mean that I have a lot of worms. Let's see, um, Maze Homestead, Homestead says, thanks for the tip. You are welcome. Yes, I said soak it with milk. Although sometimes I cheat and just use water and they go after it anyway, because I don't know what it is about bread that they like. It works not just for the mites, but it also works for the potworms. I seem to have a bit of infestation of potworms in a few of my bins, so... I've been using this method. It's not going to get rid of all of them, but it is going to reduce the population. Yes, yeah, 70. It's going to reduce the population of them. And the potworms like to stay by each other and form a ball. But sometimes the red wigglers will form a ball with them. So it is kind of a bit of a challenge to separate the red wigglers from the potworms. So when you use this method of the bread, you'll be able to get rid of a lot of the potworms, but then you will be left with another ball of a combination of your worms and the potworms. And if you are patient enough, then you can go in and, and pick them out and then get rid of the potworms, whether you want to destroy the potworms or you want to put them in your garden because they are in fact beneficial for your garden so you can just put them in your garden or release them in your soil in your yard because then they're going to be maintaining your lawn by producing breaking down whatever dried leaves and stuff like that you have there and producing some potworm castings <laughs> that's it they also seem to find wet, moist, brown material such as egg carton, which makes it easy to extract of the pesky things. Okay. Yeah, never thought of that. Never heard of that method of using the egg carton to extract them. I'm going to try it. <laughs> One of my little experimental tray, I have been putting a combination of those potworms and red wigglers that are forming balls together. So I'm gonna try that in there, see how well it works. Thanks for sharing. 
they find them irresistible. Okay. Yes, yeah, so I'm definitely going to try that method. As a matter of fact, I think I'm going to try it as soon as I finish the live because I have to go out there anyway. Yes. Okay, so if there are no other comments, then I'm going to be saying goodbye until Monday. I'm grateful for all of you guys who are on the live and sharing your information with others and for making the live a success and for simply just watching the live. Thank you all for being here. Bye, princess. <laughs> Take care, Leafy Wiggy. Okay, so I hope you guys have a really wonderful weekend and stay safe and happy gardening.